Let's take our Bibles and look once again in Psalm 45. We've been considering now for some time this particular hymn called A Song of Loves. And we saw how it describes our Lord Jesus Christ in all of his majesty. And in reality, it's a wedding song that was written to the honor and glory of the king and his bride. And so we've been looking at how this pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ because much of what is quoted here, when you go over to the New Testament, we find these same descriptions used of our Lord. For example, as we saw in Psalm 45 and verse two, Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore, God hath blessed thee forever. Let's remember that Christ is the one through whom all blessings flow. And anything that we enjoy by way of salvation comes through God having purposed to bless his son and his grace pouring here it says, into thy lips, but that word could also be translated from thy lips. So in this particular message, as we've already considered how it was necessary for Christ to come, and he's presented in the first part of this hymn as being the warrior king, the one who came forth as conqueror and to conquer. This is the difference between the Lord Jesus Christ as revealed in scripture and the little J-E-S-U-S -S that we hear about so much today in popular preaching where he would really like to save but he depends upon man to allow him to save them. That's not what we find in scripture. We find Christ being not only the one who came to work out salvation and as we saw in verse 4, truth and righteousness being established in him. God can't just forgive sinners. He must do it in accord with his truth. He must do it in accord with his righteousness or his justice. And that's why it was necessary for the Lord Jesus Christ to come to earn and establish that righteousness that God's law and justice required and that upon completion of that work, the father be satisfied with his son. How do we know he was satisfied? Well, he raised him again the third day and he ascended on high where now he's seated at the right hand of the majesty of the father and intercedes. His very presence is his intercession on behalf of everyone for whom he paid the debt. There was somebody recently that was arguing with me saying, well, I still think that Christ died for every single person in the world. And I told them if they believed that and that there were still sinners that went to hell, then what hope was that for them? That if Christ could die for somebody and yet that individual still be cast into hell, how is that salvation? Now the glory of salvation and the good news is that Christ is going to have everyone for whom he paid the debt. He said that in John chapter six and verse 37, all that the father has given me, he said, shall come to me and him that cometh I'll no wise cast out. A lot of people like to quote the second part of John six they They'll say, well, it says that he won't cast out if anybody comes, but don't forget the first part. Who comes? Who will come? All that the Father has given me shall come. They're summoned to him. And that's why he'll never cast them out. And so the descriptions we've seen there of Christ as the warrior conquering, as God's appointed Savior, all of that we looked at in verses 1 to 5. Now in this particular text, from verse 6 down to verse 12. The title here is God's Messiah King. There are a lot of people that say, well, 
Christ came the first time as Savior, but he's coming again as King. No, he came the first time both as Savior and King. And that's what we read here, beginning with verse 6. I'd love to be able to preach all the way down through the end of the chapter because it's all one hymn or song of loves. That is the love of the Father for the Son, but then also the love of the Son for his bride that he came to save, but then also the love of the bride for the Savior. And that's really in verses 13 to 17 that we'll look at next time. But here, God's Messiah, King, the name Christ really means Messiah. And Messiah means the anointed one. In the Old Testament, there were only three people that were ever anointed for their particular services. It was the prophet, it was the priest, it was the king. In the Old Testament, a prophet typically was not the king, and a king was not a prophet. Although in David's situation, he was called both prophet, and he was a king, and he was the mediator between God and the people. So in that sense, he foretold all three offices that meet together in the Lord Jesus Christ. But here we see him not only as God's Savior, but as his King. And these verses here may sound familiar to you if you you read this before in the, the epistle to the Hebrews. Thy throne, verse 6, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter, a righteous scepter. Everything about him is righteous. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. This is the answer to the question when people say, well, I don't understand what kind of God would send people to hell. Well, it's a God who loves righteousness and hates wickedness. So that means that unless Christ has been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, like it says in 1 Corinthians 1.30, then that righteousness stands against all others. And God must punish wickedness. The only reason he doesn't punish the wickedness of those sinners that Christ came to save is because Christ paid the debt. He stood in that place and bore that sin. And so complete was his work that there remained nothing but justice to declare upon the people for whom he died. But it's Christ that bore that as being God's righteousness. Therefore, God, thy God, here's that word, hath anointed thee. That's the word Messiah. That's the word Christ, the Messiah, with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia, or cassia, out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. King's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. Hearken, O daughter, and consider, and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. And the daughter of Tyre, shall be there with a gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. And that goes on into more description then of who this is that is the king's bride. But coming back here to verses 6 and 7, considering how Christ is God's Messiah King, we see here the praises of God for this one who is the anointed one. These are the words of God the Father concerning his Son. When he says, Thy throne, 
O oh God, is forever and ever. We see the king here, this anointed one, being praised and exalted as God himself. A lot of people question. They say, well, where in the Old Testament does it ever say that this Jesus who was to come was nothing more than or less than God himself? Well, here it is right here. This description that we have of him here is applicable only to the Lord Jesus Christ. David certainly is not speaking of himself here as if God were saying to him, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. We know that God promised David a posterity, a seed that would sit upon his throne forever, but that seed was Christ. So how do we know this particular verse is pertaining to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, here's where we compare scripture with scripture. And over in Hebrews chapter one, if you'd like to turn there with me, Hebrews chapter one, we find this very scripture quoted by the writer to the Hebrews in verses eight and nine. It says, unto what the son he saith, so that's how the Spirit of God directed the writer of the Hebrews to interpret what we're reading here in Psalm 45. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. You see, even here when he's writing, there were those that were being more and more fascinated with angels. And that became part of some of the teaching that was going on in the first century. It's like anything. Error begins in doctrine and in preaching whenever the focus is off of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. That's why there's much error in preaching today because people will proof text. They'll go to one portion of scripture. They're quoting scripture. But they're not pointing sinners to the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll point hearers to man They'll try to draw everything they can out of a scripture to show how man is somehow the one who decides his salvation. But there's nothing more grievous than that, to take the scriptures and apply to man what pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ alone. So here the writer in this letter to the Hebrews explains these words specifically as applying to the Lord Jesus. He noted not only that these words say that Jesus is the eternally enthroned God, but also that God the Father regards him so. That's really what he's showing here, that none other is to be worshipped, not even angels. Or as so many do today, saints, what they call saints, ones that they look to, or even sadly Mary, the mother of Jesus, is exalted above measure. None of these are to be worshipped. Worship belongs unto the Son alone. And so here the writer to the Hebrews explains that those words that the sons of Korah sang, remember they, they were the priests, the sons of Aaron, that had the task of singing the psalms before the Lord while the sacrifices were being offered. That these were the words that God the Father spoke to his son. It's interesting that even some of the Jewish writers and in their interpretations of this particular portion of the Old Testament, they will attribute this portion that we're reading here to the Messiah. But the problem is they don't believe that Jesus of Nazareth was that Messiah. They believe there's still another Messiah that's going to be raised up from among them. And yet, here very clearly, the writer of the Hebrews identifies this as pertaining to the Son of God. And so, that's why I love comparing Scripture with Scripture. We don't have to go far. Just see what the Scriptures have to say about it. I've often said the Scriptures have a lot of light to shed on men's commentaries. But coming back here, to my text in Psalm 45 in verse 7. As you would suppose, if this is indeed the Messiah King, 
then every king has a scepter. That scepter represents the king's authority and right to rule. And that's who the Lord Jesus is. And uh, as God, he's had this rule and authority from eternity. He's equal with God. No distinction between him as God and the Father as God. I know this is a mystery. There's not three gods. There's one Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit. But the Father has purposed that the Son be honored. And even Christ said when the Spirit will come, he'll not speak of himself, but he'll take those things that pertain to him, Christ, and reveal them unto you. So in, in this we see the entire Godhead as one in honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. And how is, he's on, how is he honored? As ruler, as king, as one having this scepter of righteousness. And notice in verse 6, of thy kingdom. Whose kingdom is it? It's Christ's kingdom. This is what the Father has purposed from the eternity, that Christ has that kingdom. He rules over all. And this kingdom is not founded on physical warfare this is where the lord told his disciples if my kingdom were of this world then would my disciples fight especially when it came time for him to lay down his life we know that peter was ready to fight he took out his sword and cut off the servant's ear that uh, one of the high priests had sent and the lord just picked up the ear and put it back on he said that's not how this Battle is going to be won. Put away your sword. And so his kingdom is not one of aggression and conquest. And let's remember that even now that Christ has come, lived, died, and risen again, and set it on high. How is it that he has purposed that his kingdom be established except through the preaching of Christ through the scriptures in the world? That's the only task that any that the Lord has raised up as his servants are sent to do, preach him, preach his life, preach his death, preach his resurrection, preach his ascension as God's remedy for those sinners that Christ came to save. But this kingdom is founded on righteousness. In other words, justice. So much so that the symbol of his authority, this scepter, is called the right scepter or righteousness itself. If you want to know how God saves sinners, it's according to his righteousness in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know how God condemns sinners, it's in his righteousness according to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the king. And even as he prayed in John 17 and Verses 2 and 3, he thanked the Father that the Father had given him authority over all flesh. So here we have him as the king in his kingdom. He rules over all flesh. But what does it say there in his prayer? He said to give eternal life unto as many as the Father had given him. In Christ's kingdom, where he rules over all and he rules justly, when you get into the parables, particularly in Matthew 13, you see that God has purposed that in this kingdom there be wheat and there be tares. There be sheep and there be goats. How will it all be sorted out in the end? When Christ comes again and those that in Matthew 25 it says for whom the kingdom has been prepared. The father has prepared the kingdom. They'll stand on his right hand. They'll be separated out. Right hand means to the place of authority. That's who he is as judge. He'll not lose one that the Father gave him in his kingdom. But the rest, he says to them, to be cast into everlasting darkness, such as his condemnation. I'll tell you this, unless a sinner has Christ as his representative and Savior, there is nothing but everlasting condemnation that awaits those sinners. And that's how we warn those today. Speaking to them of the Lord Jesus Christ, that salvation is in Christ's hands, but also condemnation is in his hands. And 
he acts always according to his justice. And that's why it says, as you read on there, thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. The righteousness of Christ's kingdom comes from the very character of the king himself. We know of a number of people in authority that they have the right to rule, but they don't rule rightly. Their judgments are according to their character, and their character being evil, therefore their rulings are evil. But here, when it says that his scepter is a right scepter, it's because his very character, the character of the Lord Jesus Christ, as God's Messiah King, is one of righteousness. That's why when he came to this earth to earn and establish this righteousness on behalf of his people, there wasn't anyone that could look at him or point their finger and say in any way that he did that which was evil or sinned in what he did. In fact, at one point when Christ questioned his enemies that were ready to stone him, he asked them for what good work they desired to stone him. And they told him it wasn't for any good work, but that he being a man, made himself equal with God. That's the thing that they could not and would not accept or bow to. Well, by saying that, they refused to bow to him as being that one that God had appointed to be his king. And this righteousness and hatred for wickedness is the natural result of his love for righteousness. When you want to see... People say, well, I don't see the love of God and him purposing to save some and casting others off. Well, his love is in his righteousness. He loves his righteousness. And everything he does is according to that particular righteousness. He doesn't have to work to make his kingdom righteous. It is. And that's why we can look at everything that comes from his hand. And though men might call it evil, Yet the Lord himself is righteous, and therefore all that he does is righteous. And notice the therefore then in verse 7. If we don't understand verse 6 in the first part of verse 7, we won't understand the therefore. Whenever you see therefore in Scripture, ask yourself, what is the therefore therefore? Well, this is the conclusion. For this reason, your God... That's how he's referring to his son. Thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Some may ask, well, how can God the Father look upon the Son and declare him to be God? And yet, here it speaks of the Messiah, King, as referring to his Father as his God. Well, that's who he was when Christ came in the flesh. It was to satisfy God's law and righteousness. And so everything he did as a man in the flesh was looking to his father as his God, the one to be satisfied. And because of his great righteousness, that's how we know again that Christ's work was perfect. Nothing left undone. There's no part left to man where Christ did part of it, as I heard one person say, well, 99.9% .9 is what God does, but that little remaining part, that's what we have. We have to contribute the believing. Well, I'll tell you this, if that one part was left to man to believe, none would believe, such as our nature as sinners. No, the entire thing is the work of God. And for that reason, therefore, your God, speaking there of the Son, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness. Again, the anointing referring to that blessing of God upon him as the Messiah and receiving that blessing from his God. He's blessed, here it says, with the oil of gladness. In other words, the Father is glad and satisfied in the work of his son. And therefore the son also is glad and satisfied. And that 
that more it says than any of his companions when it says with the oil of gladness above thy fellows or who are thy fellows thy fellows would represent those sinners that God was pleased to give to his son and for whom Christ came and yet he's the exalted one yes he came and dwelt among men but he's exalted above men in his person and work because he is the anointed king now the result here of being anointed with the oil of gladness above thy fellows we know that what Christ came and endured as a man he's called the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and while he was working out this righteousness to the satisfaction of his father in every aspect of its dimensions that's why left to us we could not even begin to know what it is to satisfy a holy God but that's why if you look over with me in Isaiah chapter 53 this is the work of Christ now there was not any joy or gladness necessarily in the things that he suffered and endured he was called the man of sorrows but what we're reading about here in Psalm 45 is the result remember this is therefore in light of all he came to accomplish but first it was necessary that he suffer just like it says in Isaiah 53 he is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief I don't believe we ever read a time in Christ's ministry where we find him laughing or giddy or telling jokes as so many do with regard to even his work of salvation no he was the man of sorrows acquainted with grief and that every day his sorrow began began from conception in the womb where he took on himself the form of man a body was prepared for him and every part of his life was grief and sorrow even though he himself was not a sinner yet he came to bear the sin of his people to such a degree it says there in verse 3 and we hid as it were our faces from him as we read about the Lord Jesus Christ in Scripture there's no beauty in him that we should desire him that's what it says there in verse 2 so all these artist depictions of of him as being some fair haired person with blue eyes or whatever long flowing hair all these things that's not the Lord Jesus Christ we hid as it were our faces from him and the more we study and read about what he endured as the man of sorrows certainly it does cause us to hide our faith in shame especially when we consider that it was for sinners such as we are that he did what he did he was despised and what we esteem him not there were those that looked upon him and saw him in the flesh and yet they didn't esteem him as the son of God and yet all of that he endured in order to get to where it says here thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows he was anointed to be the man of sorrows but at the same time he was appointed to the end which would be satisfaction and rejoicing in all that the father sent him to do and we know that were it left to us we could not even comprehend the depths of what it takes to satisfy God's law and justice I know people reduce it down to the Ten Commandments and they say well I'll, I'll give the Ten Commandments a shot well those Ten Commandments stand against you those are the charges against you and so there's no hope in anything you can do to satisfy God that's why the Lord Jesus Christ came but here in Isaiah 53 
In verse 11, we see what it took. Well, in verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That word bruise is the word used of taking a grain of wheat and passing it through the mill, crushing it. He hath put him to grief. And when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, not for any sin of his own, he wasn't made a sinner or sinful, but his soul was made an offering for, on behalf of the sin of his people. He, that is God the Father, shall see his seed, that's Christ, and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. I love that. Shall prosper in his hand. Everything he put his hand to do, he prospered and fulfilled. So that in the end, there would be this gladness, this being anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows. But what did it take? Verse 11, he shall see of the travail of his soul. That word travail is the, is the word of like a woman in labor. Before the birth of the child, the, there's the travail, the laboring. That's what Christ endured in his sufferings all the way to the cross. And yet, you see what it says, and shall be satisfied. There are no stillborns when it comes to Christ's work. To where any should say, well, he died for this one, but alas, they perished anyway. No, shall be satisfied. And why? By his knowledge. This is what we don't have. We can't even begin to comprehend God's holiness and justice. Not just in word and deed, but thought. But by his knowledge shall my righteous servant do what? Justify many. When Isaiah wrote this, he was looking forward to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where were those sinners justified that God the Father purposed to save? They were justified in his death, not before. God was forbearing with the sins of his people there until the cross. But when Christ died, they were justified, and so were all that the Father had given to his Son. That's an amazing thing to think about, that here I am, a child of God. I was born in this world in darkness, my mind at enmity with God, and yet I was born justified before God because of the work of Christ. And that's why it was necessary that the Spirit should in time reveal Christ in me because of all that was given him of the Father, he would lose none. That's the only reason today I have any hope that Christ paid my sin debt because the Spirit came and revealed him in my heart and showed me that long before I was ever born, there at the cross, as my representative, he paid the debt and God justified me. That's what it's speaking of here. It's by his knowledge, not me knowing him, it's him having known me, having paid my sin debt, that I stand justified. And why? For he shall bear their iniquities. That's why he was anointed. And that's the joy, the oil of gladness that we find here. The gladness of the Father for the Son, but also the gladness of the Son with regard to the Father because the work was completed. So coming back here in Psalm 45, moving on to verse 8, that's where we see the complete greatness of the anointed king as if what we've read to this point weren't enough. Oh, how profound the scriptures are in describing the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here in verse 8, it says, All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia, out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. This is another reference to the beauty and the glory and pleasantness when you think of the smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia. Such a pleasant smell that all this pertains to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some would say, oh, he smells good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's the Christ of 
scripture and you can't get a more complete picture of his beauty and his glory and his pleasantness than we have here. I know, as I said, some might imagine some very good looking man with a remarkable character of righteousness and courage and yet somehow smells bad and is therefore unpleasant to be around. It's just the opposite. There was nothing in his physical presence that drew anybody to him. He looked in that body just like any other Jew would have looked in that day. One whose skin would have been sun burnt. He walked in the sun, his feet calloused. And uh, much about him that nothing in his presence as far as Isaiah said, no beauty with which to behold him. Where was his beauty? It wasn't physical with which to behold him. And that's why I don't want to have any picture of Christ other than what the scriptures give. I would say even beware in teaching your children not to try to, well, how are they going to stand, understand if they don't have these pictures? Those are man-made. Use the scriptures to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And his beauty here with regard to his divine character and his attributes. That's really what's being described here. And says, out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. The psalmist here is not just thinking of any palace. Notice it says, but out of the ivory palaces. Kings often had several palaces, one in which they came for judgment, another in which they dwelt. And yet all of these palaces were so majestic that they were inlaid and decorated with ivory. I've got some objects of ivory that I was able to bring into the United States back before they made the rule that you could no longer transport them and bring them. And now I've got them in suitcases, but this was from my years in Africa where they would take literal ivory, elephant's tusks, and they would carve out these beautiful different objects, alligators or whatever, but also even fine little pieces of jewelry to wear around the neck. Ivory has always been considered to be something of great value. And so when you think of the ivory palaces that are worthy of the king and his splendor, pointing here to the white and pure, that's what ivory is, true ivory, white and pure, dwelling place of God. Back in the 1890s, there was a man who wrote a hymn trying to depict this particular scripture called Ivory Palaces. I don't have time to read through it all, but it begins, My Lord has garments so wondrous fine and myrrh their texture fills. Its fragrance reached to this heart of mine. With joy my being thrills. And then the verses out of the ivory palaces into the world of woe. Only his great eternal love made my Savior go. It's actually a pretty good hymn to sing. So the description here of these ivory palaces describes that work of the Lord Jesus Christ. How he would come from glory. That's really what it's speaking of here, and into this world of woe. And we know that that's the description of the Lord Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. What this is, remember, this is a wedding song. So here is the bridegroom, then the bridegroom king, as we saw last time, but here God's Messiah king, in essence, arrayed for the marriage. His garments are saturated with these costly perfumes, myrrh, aloes, and cassia. These were brought from distant lands in honor of the king. Myrrh was a product from Arabia. Aloes were perfumed wood, actually, made from an Indian tree. Cassia is one that was specific of cinnamon, 
So you can already, as I describe those things, maybe take a breath and in your mind to smell what they must have been like. And in the Song of Solomon, chapter 4 and verse 14, myrrh and aloes are actually described there as the chief of spices. Look in Song of Solomon, chapter 4. And as I've said before, there's a lot of parallel between Song of Solomon and what we're reading here in Psalm 45. Some even think that Solomon may have been the writer of Psalm 45 because of the similarities. But here in Song of Solomon 4.14, notice spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all the chief spices. That's why I say that what these describe here are the attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ, worthy of him who is King of kings and Lord of lords, and the bridegroom. I know in weddings today, all the focus is on the bride. And so you've got the, the groomsmen, and they got the bridegroom sitting down front waiting for the bride to come down the aisle, and everybody stands and turns and looks at the bride. The way it was in Scripture, and I've never been able to get anybody yet to do this in a wedding ceremony. How about the bride already being down there with her bridesmaids waiting for the bridegroom to come down? And everybody stands and looks at the bridegroom. You want to shake some people up. That'd be amazing. But that's really what this is. We've got the bride and the king's daughters in verse 9 waiting for the arrival of the bridegroom. All the glory and honor belongs unto him. All the, the glorious smell of his person, the myrrh, the aloes, and the cassia, coming out of the ivory palaces. Everybody else is waiting on him, not him waiting on them. And that's the way it is with the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there in verse 9, when it describes the king's daughters, who are among the honorable women, the anointed king is not only great for who he is, but also all those that identify with him. Here we have the king's daughters and then also the queen on his right hand. This is all a picture of the bride who would be the queen waiting on the king to come and, and take her and then the maids of honor would be the king's daughters. Those with whom the queen identifies believe that what this does prophetically, it reminds us that the measure and greatness and majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ is not only in his person, but in those that he identifies with and over whom he rejoices. They're his and he rejoices over them. When it says at your right hand stands the queen, the wedding's about to begin, and uh, here's the bride, the queen now, standing in, when it says at the right hand, verse 9, that's the place of honor next to the king. And that's where those that are the Lord's are seated with him in honor. Christ is at the Father's right hand, and so the church also is at Christ's right hand as his wife and as that one with whom he identifies and for whom he came. I had hoped to get down to verse 12, but it all fits well. Next time, we're going to look more carefully at who is this bride of the Messiah King. We've been looking at the Messiah King himself, but who is this bride? And so from verse 10 all the way to the end of the chapter, we'll pick up with that the next time, the Lord willing. But what a blessing to be able to read this psalm and to see the glory of Christ in every way in the salvation of his bride and his people. May the Lord bless his word as we've heard it. Amen.